Thanks for being here. Subscribe to Cheating Stories Best, so you don't miss new stories. A wife who had an affair with another for fun. Today we have a story with a similar plot. Enjoy watching it. Tonight is Friday evening, and despite returning home late, my wife Victoria arrived even later. I'm concerned that she often spends time with her friends after work, but I realize that everyone needs their own space, and Diana always keeps me informed of her plans. Usually, she returns home no later than 8 in the evening. Today, during a meeting, I received a message from Diana, we're out with friends having drinks. I'll be home late, my love. Diana usually takes good care of herself, and such occurrences are rare. Why does this bother me so much? Well, that's another story. In short, I have trust issues with people in general. It's preferable not to be in bars without a spouse or to travel frequently. Diana does both, and it worries me. You might ask why I have these issues and how they affect my relationship with Diana. To understand this, I'll share a brief and sad story from my past. I grew up in a bar owned by my parents, and from a very young age, I formed opinions about people and relationships. My parents were always working, and I spent time in the restaurant, where I witnessed various scenes and situations. This made me cautious and distrustful of those around me. At that moment, I felt my father's large hand on my shoulder. He squeezed it tightly and said, Mark, come with me right now. He turned and walked through the dining room, past the waiters, and into his office. I followed him slowly, feeling a sense of fear creeping in. I knew that this evening's events would lead to a serious conversation with my father. When I entered the office, he looked at me and said, close the door and sit down. I thought, oh damn, this is going to be really bad. I almost turned inside out as I sat and watched my father look at me. Finally, he sighed and spoke, Mark, I should have talked to you about this before I let you start working here, but I just didn't. I had to have the same conversation with your brother and sister, and believe me, repetition doesn't make it any easier. Mrs. Horton is a beautiful woman, isn't she, son, asked my father. I was so shocked that I jumped a little and felt a little dizzy. I wondered where my father was going with this question and why he changed the subject. While I was trying to formulate my answer, he asked again, isn't she? I swallowed and nodded my head yes, whispering, aha. Dad leaned his elbows on the table, intertwined his fingers, and rested his chin on his thumbs. I still remember his sigh and sad look. Finally, he leaned back in his chair and spoke again. I can still hear his words even twenty years later. He said, son, this business is our life and livelihood. It supports the whole family, providing us with our beautiful home and pool. It sent your brother to college, and it will send your sister and you to college too. This will take care of us all for years to come unless we do something to screw it up. Dan, if someone you know comes here with their family, you smile and greet them by name. You can visit with them while doing your work if the client wants, but you must remember one very important thing. When you're in a business like this, you have selective hearing and vision. Part of working in the food service and bar industry is discretion. You mark see anything you shouldn't see. If someone you know comes here with someone of the opposite sex who is not part of their family, you call them sir or ma'am, unless they tell you otherwise. You mark remember they were here on that occasion. You especially mark remember anything they did or how they were dressed. If our customers do something off color, we ignore it as long as we can and Mark talk about it outside of the establishment. All staff adhere to the same strict rules. If I ever hear anyone on staff gossiping about a customer, I fire him or her. I've had to fire some really great employees over the years because they couldn't keep their mouth shut about clients. We are known for our discretion and the quality of our food and service. Son, you are young, and I know how your hormones are raging. Heck, even at my age, I look at women like Mrs. Horton if I have the chance. Your mom knows that I do it and that you will do it, but she also knows that it's like window shopping, you look and never buy or try on the product. I marked expect you not to look, but I do expect you to be discreet and not make it as obvious as you did tonight. Something else you should know, son, is that people like Mrs. Horton always get exposed, the gossip will start somewhere else and eventually reach her husband. If he was like most men, it would end their marriage. People who cheat on their spouse always become careless, and eventually, the spouse finds out about it. We marked want to be the start of something like this. 
Many of them have young children, and divorce hurts the children very much. Now get back to work and remember what I said. I went back to my job that day and worked in a restaurant off and on throughout high school and college. I never gossiped about clients, but I saw too much deception for a person my age. After I got older and started working in a bar, I would watch groups of men or women come to a boys or girls party. I watched as those I knew who were married did things that I knew would not pass the test of marital fidelity. I learned, perhaps I learned too much, because I also learned to be intolerant of people who went to a guy or girl's party and stayed late. I learned that many people who were in the area on business were having fun and trying to pick up locals. Of course, it's fine if they are not married, but many of them were married or at least wore rings indicating it. In many cases, they hooked up with one of our married clients. I learned to disrespect and disgust them but treated them all with the same amount of politeness and discretion. At the end of the day, we really wanted to have a successful business. I noticed that those who came to parties and left early after a drink or two had good, stable marriages. Those who stayed late had difficult marriages, and many got divorced. During my freshman year of college, my father hired a new waitress. When I first saw Victoria, I was filled with lust. Working together over the next two years, we fell in love. We met each other's families and other relatives. We talked and discovered that we were kindred spirits. We watched all the traders who came into the bar and laughed at their antics and stupidity. Finally, the Christmas before we were supposed to graduate from college, I asked Diana to marry me. By then, we both knew that we had the same ideas about life and would be a couple for life. The only hiccup in our relationship was our parents' request for a prenuptial agreement. Diana and I knew we were life partners and thought it was stupid. My parents had a business and, to my surprise, a large investment holding. They wanted it to be protected if I inherited it. To my surprise, I discovered that Vicky's parents wanted the same thing. They had a very large fortune and did not want Diana's potential share to be shared with me if we divorced. The way the agreement was drafted solved these problems. We agreed that everything we owned before marriage or inherited from our maternal relatives would remain with us in the event of divorce. The agreement also covered pensions, each of us would keep ours. The only thing we divided was the property acquired jointly after marriage. The agreement even covered child care in the event we divorced with minor children. If one of us traveled more than the other, the children were to be placed in the custody of the parent who traveled less, unless this posed a danger to the children. The day of graduation finally arrived. Diana earned her bachelor's degree in finance and landed a great job at a locally headquartered brokerage firm. I received a bachelor's degree in construction management and a minor in landscape architecture. After college, I worked for a construction company for two years, learning the trade. Neither Vicky nor I were interested in a restaurant or bar. My parents turned it into a corporation, and we let my sister and brother run the business. Mom remained an accountant, and Dad was just Dad. He was the boss even if it didn't show on paper. After two years of working for another company, I opened my own construction and landscaping business. Since Vicky and I could barely pay for our house and cars, my parents essentially provided the capital for the family corporation's business. I received a salary to manage it. It wasn't easy for us at first, but Vicky steadily moved up the ranks. Finally, one day, she returned home very happy. She was selected for a position in the brokerage company's compliance department. This is the division that ensures that satellite offices comply with all rules and regulations of the Securities and Exchange Commission. The only downside was that her new job required some travel, not excessively, only three or four days a month, but I worried about my past overtime. My business grew over time. I went from small remodeling jobs to adding rooms and garages to building entire new buildings and landscaping them. I was happy with this arrangement, so I never tried to transfer the business out of the corporation and into my name. I just kept getting bigger and bigger salaries. To my pride, the value of the business and our gross income grew every year. I gradually came to terms with Diana's travels but never felt completely comfortable with them. Although I was not happy with her nightly walks with the girls, she went out sometimes but not more than once a month and was usually home by 8 p.m. Of course, I also had to travel from time to time, and I would sometimes go out for a beer after working with construction crews or office staff. It's just good management, 
However, I made sure to leave after a couple of beers. I usually returned home no more than an hour later than usual, even if I was meeting with my employees, unless of course Diana came with me. After we had been married for three years, Diana and I decided to have children. Our first child was Patrick, and then 18 months later, my little Suzanne arrived. She was so tiny, and as she grew, she resembled her mother more and more. When she gets older, your heart will probably stop. As Diana's experience in her work grew, she became known as the go-to person to handle difficult situations in offices. She found problems and knew how to help fix them. If she met resistance, she was not afraid to expose the criminal. If it didn't work, she wouldn't be afraid to call headquarters and use more force. Many of them were office managers who crossed her path and went looking for new jobs because of this. Vicky began to travel more. Now she was absent sometimes for two weeks a month. I hated it, and so did she. We talked, she thought she was on track to take over the department in just under two years. Then she would no longer travel and would receive a very significant increase in salary. We agreed to continue in the same spirit, waiting for such an opportunity. Because of the economic slowdown, my small company had to start looking for jobs that we would have given up before the housing market and stock market crashed. We had already laid off about half of our employees. We weren't in financial trouble because we didn't have major loans or overhead, but we weren't as profitable as we used to be. One of the small jobs I went to apply for led my marriage down a path of destruction. Oh, how I wish I had never taken this job, perhaps then I could remain happily married, perhaps not. I walked into my office Thursday morning, wondering why I even bothered to come in. The night before, I stayed late and finished all the papers that were on my desk. Diana had been away all week for compliance testing. From talking to her, I realized that she wouldn't be home until late Friday evening. So, I worked this morning. I almost went straight to one of our three work sites to spend the day getting my hands dirty and inspecting the work. As many of you know, the best way to keep employees on their toes and ensure quality is for the boss to be on the job with them and able to do their best. I hadn't been at my desk long when my assistant called me. She said, Mark, we have a casual environment here. I try to treat my employees like family. Mrs. Sloan is here and wants to talk about building a deck and landscaping her backyard. Do you have time to visit her? I remember thinking, nice little veranda and some bushes, but I decided to talk anyway. After all, a couple of days' work might be suitable and would help some men work to feed their families. When Mrs. Sloan walked into my office, I was shocked. I was almost speechless. She looked so much like Mrs. Horton, the first lady I was obsessed with, that I could barely speak. I finally pulled myself together and stood up to greet her. I smiled and said, Mrs. Sloan, I'm glad to meet you. I'm Mark Patterson. Mrs. Simpson said you want to build a porch. Is this right? Oh, excuse me, I said. Please take a seat while we discuss your needs. I'm not usually like this, but you remind me so much of a lady I knew when I was younger, it was as if she had just walked into the room. Please forgive me. Mrs. Sloan laughed and then said, Mark, it's me, Jasmine. I guess she saw the uncertainty and confusion on my face because she continued, you know, Jasmine Horton. Markita and Alfred Horton were my parents. We used to go to your family's restaurant all the time. Oh my God, I said, I'm sorry, you were much younger and have changed so much. Jasmine laughed that sexy tinkling laugh and then said, well, I guess we've all changed a little. I was only 10 years old when mom and dad got divorced, she took me in, and we couldn't afford your prices. After sighing, Jasmine began again, well, anyway, my husband and I bought a house not far from where we used to live, and he says we can build a porch and a house with a jacuzzi. I think we have something to do too if the prices are not too high. When I found out you had a construction business, I just had to see if you'd be interested in it before I contacted anyone else. We spent most of the morning talking about old times and what she and her husband Stephen had in mind. After we had a rough idea of what she wanted, I told her I would need to view the house and take measurements before I could make an offer. She said, no problem, Mark. We can go somewhere right now, or I mean, I'm not working, so I mark mine if you want to do it any time. I'll tell you what, I said, why mark that come by today around 1 o'clock in the afternoon? I need to check on my workers and get something to eat, 
and then I have all day to take measurements and make an estimate. Does it suit you? Jasmine left the office, and I followed her. I told Laura, my secretary, I won't be here until the end of the day. I'm going to check out the job sites, grab something to eat, and then go see Mrs. Sloan to evaluate her little job. Just close it when you go home. If you need me, call my cell phone. Everything was going well at work, but I stayed a little longer than I should have to visit one of the property owners. This made me late for lunch, and I got the Sloan's around 1.30. Jasmine met me at the door, and the first thing I did was apologize for being late. Mrs. Sloan, sorry for being late, I contacted one of the property owners and waited for him. I tried to call you, but I only got an answering machine. Mrs. Sloan giggled and then said, Mark, I told you, I'm Jasmine. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the call when I returned home. I was cleaning the pool and forgot to take my radio telephone with me. There's nothing special about it, now you are here. Do you want something to drink or want to explore the area? I'm fine, Jasmine, let's just go out and look around your backyard. I took all the measurements and said, well, it's no problem to estimate everything that I usually use. But since you marked have a hot tub, you really need to buy one before I give you a price. I need to know her dimensions before I can order some of the materials we'll be using. Oh, Jasmine said, I thought you would furnish the bath too. I marked know much about them, and, well, can't you just include that in the application too? I laughed and said, yes, Jasmine, I think I can do that, but we marked sell them, and I'll have to buy it somewhere else. To do this, I need to know what size you want. Will it be grounded or standalone? Will it work on 210 or 110 volts? Jasmine looked so upset that it relieved my heart. I remembered when she was younger how she could get so upset over little things. Finally, I said, well, let's talk about it for a little while, and then maybe you could call your husband or talk to him about it tonight. I can just hold off on this until you decide what kind of bath you want. Now Jasmine looked truly worried. She was almost shaking as she said, oh no, I can't call him about this. He told me to deal with it, and I intend to do so. He's on a business trip in Denver, so I won't see him until this weekend. Maybe we can just sort this out? I asked Jasmine more about how they would use the bathroom and learned that they rarely had guests, and, in fact, she was the one who used the pool and backyard mostly. Sometimes one or two friends also came to see her. Finally, I had enough information. We went to my supplier and let her look at the tubs. Jasmine decided to buy a smaller bathtub for five people. I got the measurements, and we went back to her house. I asked if she had a place where I could connect to the internet to access my office. Some of the items I needed for budgeting changed on Thursdays, and I wanted to have an accurate price list before I started working. Jasmine smiled and said, Of course, Mark, why Mark you come into the office? Steve is a manufacturer representative for saving business systems. He has a really nice office so he could work from home when he wasn't traveling. You can connect your laptop to our network portal or use our computer. Any of these options. I walked into the office and stood in amazement. He set it up almost like a regular business office in an office building. His desk was to the left of the door leading into the room. The office windows overlooked the backyard. There were two beautiful leather chairs in front of the desk and a bookshelf opposite. I was impressed. Jasmine walked behind the desk and pulled out a chair. She smiled at me and said, You can sit here while you work. If you need anything, just ask. Thank you, I said, walking to the table. I put my laptop on the table and sat down. Jasmine handed me a DSL cable to connect to my computer. When I reached for it, I had to reach for the photograph. I looked at the photo and stopped. I pulled my hand back and stared at it, then reached out and picked it up. Jasmine looked at me in confusion as she held out the cord in my direction. She saw my face and the way I was clutching the photograph and asked, Mark, is something wrong? This is my husband, my pride and joy. I keep trying to get him to throw away this photo and get another one from his cell, but he won't. I'm really tired of looking at his ex-girlfriend when I use the desk. Mark, do not look at me. So, what's the matter? Jasmine asked again. I carefully replaced the photograph and moved away from the table. I looked at Jasmine and asked, Did you tell me your husband was in Denver? 
She looked surprised and then said, Yes, I said that. Why did you ask? My wife is in Denver and stayed there all week. Jasmine, did you ask Stephen where to go for an assessment, or did you tell him you were going to talk to me? No, Mark, what difference does it make anyway? He simply told me if I needed a deck and a hot tub and to get an estimate. He said if it didn't cost more than $220,000, I could do it. So why are you asking these questions? The woman Steve is with in this photo is my wife, Jasmine. Jasmine smiled and said, Oh, it's so strange that you married Steve's ex-girlfriend. We've only been married for 18 months. When did you get married? I felt my stomach churn and looked back at Jasmine. Vicky and I have been married for nine years. This photo was taken no more than two years ago because it is of a necklace I bought for Christmas a little over two years ago. She bought an outfit that she will wear to go on vacation next summer. Jasmine stood there for a moment, then said, Mark, I feel sorry for you. If you say what I think about you, but okay, why are you worried that she's in Denver? Jasmine, you said you were married for 18 months. Do you know when this photo was taken? From what I remember of what Diana was wearing in this photo, it may have been taken around the time you got married. When did Steve have time to frame it? Why did he say? But it can't be because the photo was taken the day he won first prize at the big Chevrolet car show in the state. Jasmine began to cry and fell into one of the comfortable chairs in front of the desk. She continued quietly, it was three weeks before we got married. I just never thought. I mean, he said it was an old photo, but he was holding the first place trophy. Damn him. Jasmine, wait, Mark said, let's think about everything carefully. I saw all this while working in a restaurant. I learned to ignore other people's affairs and not talk about them because traitors are always caught in the end. I admit it looks bad, but all we know right now is that Steve and Vicky are standing in front of his car hugging each other. We also know that the photo was taken approximately 18 months to two years ago. You are quite younger than us. I Mark thinks Steve could be Vicky's old boyfriend because we started dating when we were 18 and both worked at my dad's restaurant, although he might be. I know the names of everyone she had a crush on when she was younger, no more than you probably know Steve. By the way, how old is he? He's 29, and I'm 27. Ha! Huh. Well, this is possible because Diana is not yet 31 years old. I just do not know. Crap, what should we do now? If we ask them about it, all they will do is deny it, regardless of whether they had an affair in the past or not. If they are having an affair and we ask, they may run away or simply become more secretive. I feel like I need to ask, and yet, until today, I would say that I trusted Diana implicitly. Crap, I just do not know. We talked some more and came up with what we thought was an acceptable plan. We would say nothing about what we thought we discovered that day. Jasmine wouldn't tell Steve about the conversation with me, and we would hire a private investigator to check on Diana and Steve. The next day, Jasmine and I spoke to the security company we use for our construction sites, and they referred us to the investigative company they use. We spoke with their staff and signed a contract for their services. We each gave them a check for our share of the advance and went home. Jasmine shortened the name on the check so that if Steve asked, she could say it was a deposit for the job we were talking about, and I was using a business account. Vicky never saw any checkbooks or receipts, so I was safe. I would just have to pay damages to the business. Three weeks later, Jasmine and I met with the investigator. He said, Mark, Jasmine, I'm sorry, no, this is wrong. I'm happy to report that we can't find anything to indicate that your spouses are dating or even know each other. We watched them every afternoon and after work, and they didn't do anything they weren't supposed to do. The only unusual event was last Friday when Mrs. Patterson and several of the women she works with went out after work. They went to several bars in St. Louis and danced with several men each. Vicky danced with Steve once, but it was decent. There was space between them, and neither of them allowed their hands to wander. There was no kissing or anything untoward. No one else saw them talking to each other after the dance. I sighed and leaned back in my chair. I looked at the investigator, then at Jasmine. I was beginning to believe that this whole mess was the result of my ingrained mistrust acquired while working in the family business. I checked all the phone records, 
We even installed cameras and voice recorders in the house, as well as voice recorders in Diana's car and purse. They were also spotlessly clean. Finally, I sighed and said, well, I guess we can just chalk it up to paranoia then. You have no idea how happy I am to know this, but I'm so ashamed that I even thought that Vicky and Steve would do something like that. We can just stop this. Wait a minute, Jasmine, didn't you tell me Steve was going to San Antonio next week? Jasmine looked puzzled, then said, yes, what does this have to do with, oh, we won't have to keep an eye on anyone next week, will we? I think this is exactly the moment when we need them to be monitored. Diana told me two weeks ago that she had a compliance check scheduled for next week. I marked remember exactly where she said she was going, but I think it was Austin, Texas. Depending on where in these cities they stop, the distance between them may only be about an hour or maybe less. We've pretty much established that they marked occur here in this area. I think we need to at least check this next trip. If they come out clean after this, I'm willing to admit that I acted like a paranoid fool. Despite what we saw in this photo, it's reasonable to assume that if they were old friends, Diana would have allowed him to take a photo of her with him and his trophy. Throughout all the uncertainty and investigation, Jasmine and I could see no signs that Vicky or Steve were treating us any differently. They were exactly the same as they had always been. I thought and thought, but I couldn't figure out how Diana was different from when we were dating or right after we got married. She made me feel incredibly special, like I was the sole focus of her attention. Whenever I desired intimacy, she was there for me, responding with the same affection and care that she always had throughout our relationship. The Friday night before Diana's next trip, we went out for dinner on a date. Later that night, when we were snuggled in bed, I asked Vicky, do you remember how we worked at dad's restaurant and laughed at all the cheaters and people who did inappropriate things? I thought I felt a slight tension in Diana's muscles, but I couldn't be sure. She smiled and turned her face to me, then said, yes, some of these people were definitely dumb. Every now and then, when a man or woman at work does something like this, I think back to those days and think how stupid they were. Why did you ask? Oh, one of the men at work thinks his wife is cheating on him, but he hasn't found anything to prove it. When he told me about his fears, I remembered those days and told him to just relax. I told him if she cheats, to keep his eyes and ears open, that eventually, the cheater will always be found out. I told him that the more time he takes to sort things out, the better it will be for his children because divorce always hurts children. Vicky looked a little sad as she said, why do you assume that a marriage will automatically end in divorce? Maybe the wife really loves her husband and just, well, maybe the affair doesn't mean anything to her and she doesn't want a divorce. Oh no, Diana, he's just like me, he's us, I said. Seeing people in bars and has the same low tolerance for cheating as we do. I can't imagine him just agreeing to a long-term fling like you or I would. I think he might agree to a one-night stand, but as far as a fling goes, no way. Vicky tensed again when I said I wouldn't agree to a long-term relationship, but then she smiled and turned to me. She kissed me tenderly and said, well, I'm glad you're still the man I married. We both know about outright affairs and the heartache they can bring. If he really has problems, bring him to his senses, and perhaps you and I can help him recover. Good night, sweetheart. Vicky and I settled into our bed and drifted off to sleep. However, judging by the amount of tossing and turning, neither of us fell asleep very quickly. The next week was very difficult for me. I called the investigators twice to see if they had found anything, but all they told me was, our detectives are keeping an eye on them both, and we'll have a report for you next Monday. Monday finally arrived, and Jasmine and I met in the investigator's office. When we sat down, we almost felt like he had bad news. The investigator leaned back in his chair and said, You know, when you wanted us to follow your spouses last week, I almost told you it would be a waste of money. This was one of the most difficult cheating spouse cases we have ever encountered. You were right, though. Steve and Vicky are having an affair. We have photographs and taped conversations to prove it. I must say, I'm very surprised. If only we had stopped after following them here to St. Louis, we would never have found this. In the Lewis area, from the conversations we recorded, they only get together three or four times a year in cities far away from here. Even there, they pretend that they met by chance if they happen to be in town and try very hard to maintain the appearance that they are just old acquaintances. 
However, what we found was a pair of very smart traders. They went to two different cities and stayed in two different hotels. However, they met at the third hotel, and even then, they did not stay in the same room. They rented separate rooms at different times, but the rooms had an adjoining door. Steve paid for his room in cash, so there was no paper trail. Vicky registered as Angela Foster and used a credit card in that name with an address in Washington, Missouri. She had a government ID in the name of Angela Foster. Steve checked in as Stephen Allen, again using his government ID card for identification. Also, they only rented these rooms from Tuesday to Thursday. They did not stay long and only saw each other on those two days. I sat back in my chair and thought. I said, Foster? Vicky's maiden name is Victoria Angela Foster. Jasmine just said, Alan is Steve's middle name. Well, I said, I think it's all over except for the tears. I will speak with a divorce lawyer as soon as I can make an appointment. Jasmine started to say something when the investigator intervened. He said, wait, that's not all. Usually, I mark even mention it, but in this case, I just can't convince myself that this is what it looks like. I know they had sex, but damn it doesn't feel like a fling. It's more like they were playing some kind of game. We have hours of taped conversations, and most of them are very harmless. There were only two sexual intercourses the whole week, and the conversation in bed was so strange. Here, let me put in a tape and show you what I mean. When the investigator played the tape to the point he wanted us to hear, we heard Diana speak. She said, you know, Steve, I'm starting to think we need to end this. We've been doing this for six years now, and we've had fun. We have proven that we are the exception to the rule in Smart Trader. I think even you will agree that sex with each other is not nearly as good as with our spouses. Also, something Mark said on Friday night bothers me. We talked in bed, and he reminded me of what we learned at his parents' restaurant. He reminded me that all traders are caught sooner or later. No one ever considers all possible options. Eventually, all cheaters either become overconfident or make one small mistake that gets them caught. I'm still worried about Denver. It was the first time we went to the same city, and I still think it was a mistake. We shouldn't have changed the plan. We should only get together when we could go to different cities close enough to each other that we could meet in the middle, like we do here now. I know it's a hassle to rent two rooms and pay for a room we marked use, but still, I think we've proven what we set out to prove. We are smart cheaters, and if you play the game smart, you can cheat and win. I really marked want to do anything that could cause me to lose Mark. I love him to death. He is the best man I have ever met in my life. Hell, after we got together the first time or two, the only real charge I got out of this whole mess was planning and scheming. I can spend hours planning and thinking about deception. Getting documents, booking a room, and organizing a trip is better than solving a crossword puzzle or Sudoku. Damn sex only dulls my horns now. Mark pretend to be a man. I know for sure that you feel the same. You told me in Denver that you always returned to your hotel unsatisfied. The investigator stopped the recorder and spoke again. He said, that's not all, but this was the most mysterious part of the conversations. I just can't for the life of me understand why. The investigator stopped and stared at me as I started laughing. Finally, I pulled myself together and said, I'm sorry. I really Mark think it's funny, and I'm mad as hell, but, well, there's something in this conversation that I think I need to enlighten you about. You see, a few years ago, a couple that Diana and I were friends with got divorced. His wife cheated on him, and she got caught. It turned out that she had been colding her husband for almost four years before she was caught, and that it was just a simple little mistake that she made. The night we found out about the affair and divorce, we were hanging out with other friends. We entered into a discussion about deception and stupid things that traders do. We remembered once again what my father said when we worked in the restaurant and what we saw while working there. Diana continued to say that she was convinced that any person who wanted to cheat could do it if they just kept it under control and were smart. I was on the other side of the argument and told her that there was no way this could happen, that at some point the traitor would be caught. It may take years, but it will happen. I told her that the deception might even come up in some harmless way, but it would come up in the end. We stuck to our guns. But for a few weeks, Diana had mentioned something about smart cheaters winning. 
As far as I remember, her affair with Steve began around the time we argued. Diana has always prided herself on her intelligence, and now I think I pressed the wrong button when we talked about this novel. I think she was trying to prove that she could do it and get away with it. I think she could have marked it if she had stopped earlier. Now, no, she won't get away with it. Jasmine and I were back together, this time we were waiting to meet with a divorce lawyer. Since sharing the costs of the investigator went so well, we decided to also hire a divorce attorney. When I was called into the office, the lawyer looked surprised. He said, Mr. Patterson and Mrs. Patterson? I grinned and said, No, sir, I'm afraid not. I'm Mark Patterson, and this is Jasmine Sloan. We discovered that her husband and my wife were cheating on us and split the investigator's bill to get dirt on them. Now we thought we might as well split your fee, lawyer. George Spaulding smiled and gestured toward the chairs, saying, Oh, of course, maybe we can work something out. Could you please sit down while we discuss this? I sat down and handed the lawyer a copy of the investigator's report and photographs. Before the lawyer could look at them, I said, I Mark think my case will be too difficult. I also brought a list of everything Vicky and I own and when and how we acquired those items. I also have a copy of our prenuptial agreement, which states not only how we will divide property but also who has custody of the children. All I want is a divorce due to adultery and a settlement according to the prenuptial agreement. I'm afraid Jasmine's case will be a little more complicated. I handed my lawyer the documents I had brought to confirm my divorce. I sat back in my chair and waited for him to look through the forms. After the lawyer completed the paperwork for me, Jasmine gave him almost the same thing for herself. The only difference was that she didn't have a prenuptial agreement. The lawyer explained to us the essence of the divorce process, the time frame, and the schedule of his fees. He then discussed what Jasmine would want from her divorce if she could get one. Finally, he said, I think I've had enough for now. I need to review all the documentation and the investigator's report. If I have any questions, I will of course call. Otherwise, I will prepare the documents and move on. Do you want me to just hand out the papers or call you first? Jasmine and I wanted a call when the documents were ready to be served. We left the office and returned to our business, agreeing to keep in touch. Two days later, George Spaulding called me. After the pleasantries were over, George said, Mark, I looked at everything you gave me, and I have to say that this is the strangest case I have ever seen. I even asked two of my partners to review it, and they agreed. Sure, there was cheating, but damn, man, I think it's pretty obvious that the woman loves you, and, well, damn, it doesn't even look like an affair. It's almost as if it was a game and they had to have sex to play. Mark, are you sure you want to continue with this scam? I mean, damn, from everything you said, you had an almost perfect marriage. You didn't fight. Your sex life was above par. You seemed to love and respect each other. Mark, if you marked mind me saying so, it's almost as if you were playing the game too. Now it's your turn, and the only choice you have is divorce. Can't you talk to Diana and forget about it? I know you listened to the tapes, and she told Steve that they needed to break up and that it was basically just a game for her. I sat down and thought again. Finally, I said to George, No, George. I asked myself the same question, and one day I thought I could do just that. I think if it was just a game and they weren't having sex, if they were only together in an emotional or better yet, pretend romance, I might be able to ignore it. I think at first, maybe Diana was just upset that I made fun of her belief that she could be a smart cheater. She simply could not accept my statement that there were no smart traders and that it was a foregone conclusion that traders would eventually be caught. If she hadn't taken the final step and let Steve make love to her, I might have forgotten about her cheating. It just went on for too long. I mean, six years, even if the sex was lousy and they didn't get as much pleasure from each other as they did from Jasmine and me, it was still adultery, and she had to pay the price for it. George sighed and said, Well, it's your life. I just hate doing this to you. I have documents ready to submit. When do you want her to be notified? I smiled and said, well, George, he and Steve are on the East Coast this week. She should be back late Friday afternoon. Can we notify her on Friday at work? I'm guessing her plane lands at noon, so she should be in her office at, say, 3.30 or 4. I'd like her to be notified and given the tape I have for her. 
This is a fragment of her conversation in which she and Steve talk about the breakup. You can listen to it, of course, but at the end, I say they lost. Like I said, cheaters will always screw up and get caught. On Friday morning, I gathered all my crew in my office before they headed to their work sites. I explained that Diana and I were getting a divorce and why. I told them that they should not take orders from her and not tell her anything more about the business or my personal life. When they left, Laura, my secretary, said, Oh, Mark, I'm so sorry. I just can't believe Diana would do something like that. I still remember how she hates traitors. Laura laughed and continued, I mean, some of the comments she used to make when we saw someone we knew doing something like that. At 4.10 the same day, my lawyer called me and said that the documents had been served. Around 4.30 that same day, I received the phone call I had been dreading. Using the caller ID, I realized it was Diana. I picked up the phone and said, Hello, Diana? I heard sobs, then a quiet, weakly trembling voice said, Mark, please, can't we end this? You know that I love you with all my heart. I know I was so stupid. Now, but you pissed me off the hell that night when you lectured me in your arrogant way for saying something a smart cheater could get away with. Mark, for the first year, all we did was plan and meet just to show that we could do it. I know you heard me when I told Steve I didn't love him and the sex wasn't even that good. You know we were going to stop. Please Mark do this to me. I still can't believe you actually found out about this after all these years. I'd like to know how the hell you did it. Diana, I didn't do this to us, you did. Now I have to end this. I thought we were completely on the same page about cheating and affairs. I thought, damn it, I knew none of us would approve of cheating. We agreed that in the end, traitors get what they deserve. I guess, no, I'm just wondering how you could even do something like that. How could you even justify this? Feeling that we both experienced. I decided to take pity on Diana. In a sense, I decided to tell her how I found out about this affair. Diana, I never intended to tell you how I caught you, but now I think I will. You were partly right when you said you shouldn't have gone to Denver together. That Thursday before you came home, I was in the office, and Jasmine Sloan walked in. She wanted us to then build a deck and landscape her backyard. She let me use Steve's office, and I saw a picture of you with him and the trophy his car won at the state classic Chevrolet. She told me that you were one of his old girlfriends. I almost bought it until I realized that in the photo, you look old enough that it happened recently. In addition, you were wearing jewelry and clothes that I knew were only about two years old. I was almost ready to put aside my fears and assume that you were dating before we became a couple and just somehow ran into him at the car show. I changed my mind when Jasmine and I talked a little more, and I learned that you were both in Denver that week. We have decided to hire an investigator and follow you. We kept tabs on you both for the next month, and with the exception of one dance at your friend's party, you two had no contact. We were going to stop investigating and write it off as a coincidence that you just happened to see Steve and posed for a photo with him. By that time, Jasmine and I were exchanging all kinds of information about you, too, and I remembered that she told me that Steve was going to be in San Antonio. And you told me that you were going to be in Austin. We decided to follow you during this week. If we didn't find anything, we were going to throw it away. But we found something, didn't we? I heard sniffling in the background. Then Diana said, Mark, Mark, I love you very much. I do not want to lose you. Can't you just please forgive me just this once? I sighed and answered, No, honey, I just can't. At least, I can't right now. I think I could if you hadn't cheated on me, but I just can't get over the fact that you had sex with him and how long you had an affair. But, honey, Mark, you see, it wasn't really a novel. I was, well, it was more like a game. I just had to prove that it was possible. Sex, well, sex was because we were away from home and we were horny as hell. You know, it was almost as if we were using each other to masturbate. We didn't make love, and as far as I remember, we never told each other that we loved each other. It was always about playing the game, and then for the last four years, just getting some sexual relief. Diana, it doesn't matter. All that matters is that you did it. You planned to make me a cuckold, and you succeeded. You were supposed to meet Steve somewhere and planned to meet him. 
I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if this happened at one of your friend's parties. Isn't it? Diana sighed and said, Yes, Mark, that's how it was. At that time, we were just talking. He came up to the table and invited me to dance. The girls and I were talking about a couple we saw at the bar and worked with. They attacked each other, and I made the remark we always made about smart traders and how there are no such things as we danced. I told Steve about our conversation and what we believed in before leading me back to the table. He said, You know, I bet we could beat that pattern. I travel a lot, and if I could find someone who did the same, I bet we could meet in another city far from home and could cheat without anyone ever catching us. We danced a few more times that evening and decided to try it. I learned that he was traveling as a manufacturer's representative, and he learned that I was conducting a compliance review. We compared notes and found out that in about three weeks, we would be in the same area, so we agreed to meet. At that meeting, we began to plan our, at that time, ideal non-sexual romance. We agreed never to call each other either at home or on our mobile phones. We mostly used burner cell phones and called from work during lunch, but only to arrange our next meetings. We received fake IDs. I got a new credit card and sent the bill to the mailbox near my parents' house. You know how often I go to them to check the flag regularly. We've covered everything except the photography. I just had no idea that he still had it. Diana smiled sadly and continued, I think, as we always said, just one little mistake and the traitor will be caught. I'm so sorry, honey. I guess I was just so carried away by the intrigue. I love you. I heard a click when Diana hung up. I was surprised to feel tears running down my cheeks. I sat back in my chair and thought. I never knew when Laura said goodnight to me. My next memory was how I shuddered because it was dark outside. Before the final decision on divorce, and at different times, both sets of parents tried to dissuade me from divorcing Diana. Perhaps the most sincere request came from her parents. One Saturday, they called me and asked if they could come to my house and visit the children. Naturally, I agreed. After they had some time with the kids, all three of us adults sat in the lounge chairs by the pool in the shade, watching the kids in the pool. Vicky's mother turned to me and said, Mark, we all know that my daughter has made a complete ass of herself. When she came to our house that first night, she was devastated. We had a hard time getting out of her what was wrong. She was hysterical and said she had ruined everything. We finally calmed her down enough to get the whole story out of her. She showed us all the evidence you had on her. Mark, I have to say that if I had caught her father doing what she did, I would have left him too. But can't you do what I say instead of what I would do? I know she loves you very much. I see it every time she looks at you, every time she talks about you, every time she sees your photo. Her problem is her damn intellectual superiority. She was so used to being the smartest woman around that she had to prove that she could handle something like this. Mark, did you ever think that maybe you kind of pushed her into this? She told me about your argument over friends just before she decided to prove that she could have an affair without getting caught. I looked at my mother-in-law and said, Yes, Mona, I thought I might have contributed to her affair. I think because I said that if she had just met him and they didn't have sex, I could have gotten over it. But she didn't. You know how we both said we were cheaters before we got married. You know how adamant she was about the additions to the prenuptial agreement that dealt with infidelity. Then she did something like this. No, I just can't leave it like this. I'm breaking my heart over this, but I just can't. The divorce was final, and for once, I was glad we had a prenuptial agreement. We had some investments that we had to share. Besides, we own this house together. Since my business was registered in the family's name, and the only shares I had were considered gifts to me, Diana did not receive any share in it. I allowed Diana to withdraw the value of her share of the house from the investment account, so I owned it outright. I was always nice to Diana when I saw her and never gave her any trouble about visiting the children. I still wanted to hug her when I saw her, but I knew I could never trust her again. One day, I was taking the kids out to dinner when Jasmine walked into the building. She stopped at the door and looked around. She seemed unsure of herself. The hostess approached her and asked about the number of guests. Jasmine raised one finger. I saw this and jumped out of my chair. 
I intercepted the hostess and Jasmine before they reached her table. Jasmine, good to see you, I said. I saw you tell Patty that you were alone. If you want, just my children are with me. We could sit at the same table. Jasmine looked at me for a moment, then smiled. I felt my heart lighten, and the whole room seemed brighter. She stepped towards me, quickly hugged me, and kissed me on the cheek. Thank you, she said. I think I would like it. I've been so lonely since. After Jasmine was seated, I introduced her to my children. Even before she opened the menu, my father was next to the table and said, Mark, are you hiding something from me? Who is this beautiful lady? I laughed, and Jasmine smiled. I turned to my father and said, Dad, this is Jasmine Sloan. It was her husband, ah, uh, her mother was Marky to Horton. They came here often when I was a child. Mr. Patterson smiled and said, Oh yes, now I remember you. You look so much like your mother that I can't believe I didn't recognize you. How are your parents? I haven't seen them for many years. Jasmine looked at Mr. Patterson and said, I guess they're both okay. Sometimes I talk to my dad on the phone. After the divorce, he moved and is now in Kansas City. I see my mother a couple of times a month. She lives north of the city. Well, I hope you have a good time tonight. I hope that now that you remember where we are, you will come back here more often. After Jasmine placed her order, I asked, How are you doing? I wish I had called more, but summer is my busiest time of year. Although I probably used that as an excuse. I could find the time. I'm really sorry. Oh, Mark be stupid, Jasmine said. I know that you are busy, and I didn't call you either. In fact, I'm here tonight to celebrate. Steve finally gave in, and today my divorce was final. We had to sell the house, and we split everything 50 50 -ths. Because of this, he fought child support and got a divorce. But since he was the one who didn't want me to work, I eventually won. I had to rent a small crummy apartment, but as soon as I find a job, I'll find a better place. After eating, the children became more and more restless. Jasmine and I talked and even ordered a second bottle of wine. Finally, I said to Jasmine, I think I need to go before these two bullies ban me from this place. It was really great talking to you again. Maybe we can do something similar again. Jasmine smiled and nodded her head. She said, I would like that. I can afford it. She called the waitress and asked for the bill. The waitress smiled and said that both bills were paid. I laughed and said, that old idiot. I usually cry, and he knows it. I think he's trying to set us up. I reached into my wallet and put the appropriate tip for the waitress on the table, then stood up. Come on, children, go say goodnight to your grandparents and let's go home. I helped Jazz up from her chair and offered her my hand. May I escort you to your chariot, my lady? I asked. Jasmine smiled, took my hand, and said, You can, good sir. As we waited for the kids to return, I turned to Jasmine and said, You know, I really marked want this night to end. Before you came, I was hoping that I could get home in time to just sit by the pool and relax. All I was looking forward to was spending the night alone with the kids. Jasmine looked at me and said, Me too, except that we marked have a pool in our apartment, and I marked have kids. Jasmine, it's still early. Would you like to come visit me again after I put these two to bed? Jasmine smiled and nodded her head affirmatively. She whispered, yes, I would really like that. After the kids went to bed, I stocked the refrigerator with wine, beer, soft drinks, and ice. I placed it between the sun loungers by the pool and told Jasmine to choose for herself. I reached for the Pepsi and leaned back in my chair. Jasmine also took a Pepsi. I looked at the pool, glistening in the dim light, sighed, and turned to Jasmine. I said, you know, I think your mother is partly responsible for my divorce. I. Oh, damn, I'm sorry, Jasmine. I shouldn't have said that. I was just wondering. Well, I mean, Jazz sat and looked at me in horror. I thought I saw a small tear in her eye. I rose from my chair with difficulty and sat down on the edge of Jasmine's chair. I wiped a tear from the corner of her eye and said, Let me now explain that I made a complete ass of myself when I was 16. 
I had only been working at the restaurant for about three weeks when your mother walked in with a strange man. They had dinner and then went to a bar to drink and dance. I always thought your mother was the most beautiful woman in the world until I met you. Anyway, I couldn't take my eyes off her, and my father not only saw me looking at her but also heard me say that I should tell my friends about what I saw when we got to school next Monday. PHW I still remember the reprimand and lecture that I listened to that evening in his office. I think that evening, however, influenced my thoughts and beliefs about marital fidelity to this day. You know that later, Diana came to work with us and was given the same lecture. We used to talk so much about our experiences and what we saw in the restaurant. I thought we agreed with my father's philosophy. Maybe, although I was too stubborn about fidelity for my own good. I just thought that my meeting with your mother that night set me on the tough path I've been on throughout this whole case. I'm sorry, and before you ask, no, none of my family or our employees read it out your mother. I mark know who did it, but it was almost a year after that incident before your parents got divorced, and as far as I know, that was the only time she and her male friend were in a restaurant. Jasmine looked at me and said, well, maybe something good came out of this mess then, or maybe not, depending on how you look at it. You know, she married this man, and they lived together until he died in a car accident a few years ago. I'm not sure, but I think she cheated on him too. I have always heard that once a cheater, remains a cheater. After I was sure Jasmine had stopped crying, I returned to my chair, and we started talking about more interesting things. I learned that she had a degree in accounting and had worked in accounting for some time. I smiled to myself because I remembered my mother complaining about how she wanted to get more rest but couldn't since she did the books for the bar and restaurant and also helped supervise the wait staff. I also thought that I should hire some kind of nanny for Laura. Maybe the following Wednesday. I hadn't been home from work long enough to do anything other than drink a glass of water when I heard a knock on the front door. I opened it and was hit in the chest with something soft but heavy. I focused my gaze and saw Jasmine King hanging on my neck and trying to kiss me. She said through tears, Thank you, oh thank you. Your parents called me and offered me a job. I went for an interview and test, and they hired me. I start tomorrow. They pay me too much. And she started crying again, and I just hugged her to my chest and stroked her hair. Over the next few months, Jasmine and I grew closer and closer. I started taking the kids out to dinner four or five times a week and seemed to space out the visits so that the accountant was free to dine with them. Christmas came, and Jasmine was invited to dinner at the Pattersons. Me and Jasmine both helped prepare the New Year's party at the bar. My father and brothers and sisters constantly complained that we were of little use. Every time they looked for us, they found us hugging and kissing. However, all this was said in jest. By this time, we were already an established couple. Every invitation one of us received automatically included the other. Valentine's Day arrived. It was another big day for the restaurant and bar, so Jasmine and I had to work again. After most of the customers had left the restaurant, I walked into the restaurant part of the building and said, Jasmine, could you come to the bar for a minute, please? The band is on break, and I need you to help me get on stage for a moment. Jasmine smiled and said, of course. I needed a break from this place anyway. When we got on stage, I asked Jasmine to hold the microphone stand while I knelt down. I pulled on its bass and then raised my voice. I said, hey, I need some light, can you get it for me? Jasmine was looking around for a light source when one of the spots illuminated both of us. I said, Jasmine, the microphone picked up my voice and transmitted it throughout the hall. When Jasmine looked down at me, she saw me holding something out for her to take. It was a black square, and she thought it might be part of a black microphone stand. The light was quite bright, and she couldn't see very well. As she reached for the object I was holding out to her, I spoke again. I said, Jasmine, I'm down here, groveling at your feet. I beg you, will you marry me? You brought sunshine back into my life, and now I'm only happy when I'm with you. As soon as Jasmine's fingers touched the box, her mind deciphered what I was saying. She closed the box with her hands and said, What? I repeated my question, Will you marry me? Jasmine opened the small box and saw a beautiful ring inside. Her jaw dropped, she gasped, and brought her empty hand to her mouth. She then slowly took the ring out of the case. In slow motion, 
She looked at me, then began to put it on the ring finger of her left hand. Tears streamed down her cheeks. She knelt down and gave me a deep, long, sensual kiss. Yes, she moaned, oh yeah, I love you with all my heart, and I've been dreaming for months that you would love me too. The hall resounded with whistling and hooting. When Jasmine came out to take a breath, she saw my whole family gathered around. My brother lifted her to her feet and hugged her. Then she was passed from person to person as they hugged and congratulated. Our lucky star's Jazz has scheduled her wedding for June. Over the past months, she has slowly moved her belongings from her small apartment to my house. At the post-wedding reception, Jasmine and I opened gifts. At the very bottom of the pile lay a single yellowed envelope. Inside was a heart-shaped valentine that seemed as old as the envelope. The original signature has been erased. Looks like it could be me. On the valentine were written the words, I received this valentine from the only man I have ever loved on our first Valentine's Day. Since then, I have carefully kept it. Somehow it seems fitting that I pass this on to you now. Perhaps this is a symbolic transfer of his heart from me to you. May the rest of your lives be filled with love and attention for each other. May you never break another's heart or allow foolish pride to tear you apart. Congratulations. I wish you both a life full of love and happiness. With all my love, Victoria. What do you think of today's story? In my opinion, the story is quite informative and interesting. What is your opinion? Write in the comments. See you in the comments.